The committee will come to order. We get somebody to close the door. Oh, thank you, Bob. <laughs> Thanks, everybody, for joining us for today's oversight hearing called a call for system wide change evaluating the independent assessment of the Veterans Health Administration. This morning, we're going to discuss the findings and recommendations of the independent assessment of VA's health care delivery system and management processes. The assessment was required last summer by the Veterans Access, Choice, and Accountability Act and was intended to develop a path forward for the VA health care system that was then and still does uh, continue to have difficulties. The Secretary's prepared remarks for this morning's hearing call the assessment a valuable instrument for validating the areas that require attention. And in a presentation two weeks ago before the Commission on Care, Dr. Shulkin, the Undersecretary for Health, called the assessment an excellent tool. But I see the assessment as much more than that. It's more than an instrument, and it's more than a tool. The assessment encompassed a review of virtually every aspect of VA health care and over the course of more than 4,000 pages, it described in painful detail the numerous significant and systemic flaws that challenged the health care system that is tasked with providing high quality health care to our veterans. The assessment then thoughtfully lays out what steps need to be taken to transform the broken VA healthcare system into one of one that our nation's veterans can truly be proud of. Perhaps most alarming are the assessment's finding regarding leadership. For example, the assessment found that VA healthcare facilities are plagued by an ever growing but ineffective bureaucracy that has ballooned by 160% over the last five years without resulting in any discernible improvement in business or health outcomes. That could be because the assessment also found that VA suffers from an expanding scope of activities that has led to confusion about strategic direction and leadership priorities. It has an unnecessarily complex and fragmented organizational structure. It's characterized by a culture that is risk averse and distrustful and is run by a workforce that is steadily losing its motivation, consumed by addressing crisis after crisis and lacks a leadership pipeline that's failing to attract and train the next generation of healthcare leaders. Sadly, these findings are not new to those of us who have been working on these issues. In fact, many of them are things that those around this dais have been discussing in this hearing room for many years. However, they are startling, and they are deserving of both our immediate attention and our prolonged commitment to a sustained change, a change that will come from nothing short of a top-to-bottom transformation and a willingness to have difficult conversations about VA's true mission and should be in support of our nation's veterans. Unfortunately, rather than detailing VA's plan for system systematically implementing in the recommendation of the assessment and deviating from the status quo that is harming our veterans. The testimony uh, that we will be hearing today repeats a lot of the same talking points that we have heard in the past. For nine pages, VA provides little in any way of concrete details about what, if any, specific actions VA is taking as a result of the assessment and how we as a committee can assist the VA in its efforts. But VA does take time in their testimony to repeat misleading talking points from May regarding House passed fiscal year 2016 budget, equating it to a VA medical care budget cut and claiming it would result in 70,000 fewer veterans receiving care. Both of those allegations are untrue, as the Washington Post fact checker pointed out earlier this year. In fact, the VA budget that the House has proposed represents an increase in VA's discretionary budget and would continue the trend of budget increases that have led to more than 70% increase in the bottom line over the last six years. 
I appreciate the Secretary being here today, taking time out of his schedule, but we both can agree that we each can do better and make more out of the assessment that is before me today if we avoid retorting to disingenuous talking points and instead focus on the hard work that lies before both of us. Our veterans cannot afford to let this assessment become just number 138, gathering dust on some shelf locked away where nobody else will see it again. And before I yield to the ranking member, I'd like to take a moment to thank the MITRE Corporation, the RAND Corporation, the Institute of Medicine, McKinsey and Company, and Grant Thornton for their efforts in completing this assessment. I'm also grateful for the efforts of the members of the Blue Ribbon Panel who selflessly lent their expertise as well. Thank you all for your hard work. I guarantee that our hearing today is just the start of this committee's work regarding the many thoughtful findings and recommendations uh, that this group has laid out for us. And I rec recognize the ranking member, Ms. Brown, for her opening statement. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, before I begin my statement, uh, Mr. John E. Arnold is here. He's a Vietnam veteran, and he came all the way from Jacksonville. And I would just like for him to stand because this is what this is all about, veterans. Sir, from Jacksonville, would you just stand? And thank you for your service. Thank you. <laughs> Last year, in the Veterans Access Choice and Accountability Act of 2014, we mandated that there be an independent assessment of veterans' health care. This morning hearing is on the results of that independent assessment. The assessment highlights many of the things we hear from our veterans. We hear that the VA provides excellent health care, especially health care related to the special needs of the veterans. We also hear that in certain areas, VA is the forefront of health care in this country. We also hear from our veterans that VA care is often fragmented and that it can be difficult to navigate and arrange non-VA care. We hear of long waiting times and limited access. For us on this committee, the results of this assessment is not new. Over the years, and for me it's 23, we've seen a system be admired and bureaucratic and be required to do more when sometimes the resources to do more have not been made available. What the independent assessment provides us is a detailed, thorough, and fair look at where the Veterans Health Care Administration is and the steps that we must take together to get it back to the right track and focus on veterans. What is clear is that if we are to meet our promise to the veterans, we must begin to look at reform. This reform must enable veterans to focus on health care and operations like the Secretary has previously stated, as a business. And the business of the Veterans Health Administration must be clear and unwavering focus on the veterans patient. The independent assessment points out that piecemeal fixes and legislation target at only one issue will not cut it. VHA needs a complete overhaul from the way it schedules and delivers care to patients to the way it treats its employees and I want to point out in the way we partner with com community providers. It is approaching two decades since VHA last underwent a major reform effort. We must now begin the work of ensuring that VA healthcare is poised to meet the challenge of healthcare today and the independent assessments will help us in this endeavor. I look forward to hearing from the Secretary as to what steps to be taken to begin the reform process and to hear from our other witnesses as to how we can work together to ensure that health care for our veterans receive the very best. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you very much, Ms. Brown. We're joined this morning by the Honorable Robert McDonald, Secretary of the Department of Veterans Affairs, better known to many people as Bob. 
Secretary McDonald is accompanied by the Honorable David Shulkin. He's the Under Secretary for Health. Dr. Shulkin, thank you for being here too. We're joined by Richard Burns, Senior Vice President of the MITRE Corporation, the Independent Assessment uh, Program Integrator, and by uh, Dr. Giroir, uh, who is Senior Fellow of the Texas Medical Center Health Policy Institute and the Chairperson of the Independent Assessment Blue Ribbon uh, Panel. Uh, Mr. Secretary, we appreciate you being here. Two things before we begin. Thank you for allowing us to compress into a single panel uh, instead of doing two panels today. Uh, and secondly, uh, your staff had asked for a 10-minute uh, opening statement, but because of time and many of the questions uh, that members have today, uh, I've, I've asked that uh, you restrict your comments to five minutes uh, so that we can ask the question. All members can avail themselves to the Secretary's written comments uh, that are in uh, the uh, binder before you. So, Mr. Secretary, you're recognized for five minutes. Chairman Miller, Ranking Member Brown, members of the committee, I'm pleased to be here with Dr. David Shulkin, Under Secretary for Health, to talk about the independent assessment and all that VA is doing to improve the veterans' experience at VA. I think this is the most important hearing that we've had since I've been Secretary because it's the first hearing that we've had on the transformation of VA. For the most part, the assessment uh, which, as you know, started uh, over a year ago, confirms our own analysis, and I'm pleased to say we've already started taking action. The assessment had a great deal of information on known problems, but also had some new ideas uh, that we are incorporating into the transformation we're doing. One aspect of the assessment's findings and recommendations deserves special emphasis, and that's the misalignment of requirements and resources. We know now that the access crisis of 2014 was mostly a matter of growing demand for VA health care, overwhelming our capacity for supply. For example, we have a requirement that all disability claims should be adjudicated in under 125 days, and we've made outstanding progress in meeting that requirement. We've cut the backlog of those claims from 611,000 in May of 2013 to less than 75,000 today. But we've done that by having our workers, our VBA workers, work mandatory overtime for over four years. We've, conditioned, we've uh, incrementally put more people in the budget each year. Those have been stripped out. We obviously need more people if we're going to be able to get these claims uh, down, to, down to zero. So this is a classic case of where the 125-day requirement and the budget that we've been given don't match, and we can't have people working overtime forever. I take issue with one of the assessment's recommendations, and that, uh, that one is that Congress establish a governance board to, and I quote, develop fundamental policy, define the strategic path, insulate VHA leadership from direct political interaction, and ensure accountability for the achievement of established performance measures. I believe this is a role of this committee and the Senate Veterans Affairs Committee working collaboratively with the department and me. We've proven that VA can make changes needed to provide veterans with the care and benefits they deserve. All we need to do is have your support and work together to do so. At the enterprise level, our My VA transformation is well underway, providing both short-term and long-term support for effective responses to many of the assessment's recommendations. As you know, we have five strategies. First is improving the veteran experience. Second is improving the employee experience. Third is achieving support service excellence. Fourth is establishing a culture of continuous improvement. And fifth is enhancing strategic partnerships, and we would be happy to drill down on those during the question period. We're also implementing VHA's Blueprint for Excellence, detailing how VHA will evolve as a model healthcare provider. It's designed to improve access to health care, create a personalized experience for each veteran, and bring VHA's performance measures and reporting requirements in line with those in use throughout the health care industry. Now, in the past year, we've moved out aggressively in response to the access crisis, meeting increasing demand and expanding capacity on four fronts. More staffing, more space, more productivity, and more VA care in the community. During that period of time, we've completed 7 million more appointments uh, for veterans of completed care, 4.5 million in the community, 2.5 million within VA. We've added more space, we've added more providers, we've added more um, uh, extra hours, uh, all in effect to get more veterans in. 
But because of that, and because we've done a better job of caring for veterans, we have more veterans desiring care. So even though 97% of appointments are now completed within 30 days of the needed preferred date, the number not completed in 30 days has grown from 300,000 to nearly 500,000. This brings us back to the fundamental problem, the imbalance of supply and demand and the need of congressional action. So let me get to what we need. The House proposed $1.4 billion reduction of the VA's budget request would mean $688 million less for veterans' medical care and a 50% cut in VA's construction budget. A 50% cut in construction budget at a time that our facilities, 60% of our facilities uh, are over 50 years old doesn't make any sense. Second, we need Congress to give us the flexibility to align resources with veterans' demand for care, as the independent assessment suggested. Third, we need Congress to act on the proposal we submitted May 1st to end the uncertainty about aspects of purchase care that are outside the Veterans Choice Program and that complicate provider participation in VA's other care in the community programs. Finally, we need Congress to address the many statutory issues that burden VA with red tape and bureaucracy. This is a problem most, almost everywhere in VA. We simply can't make many necessary changes because of statutory limitations. We need to consolidate our various care in the community programs. We need a freer hand to hire, assign, and reward the executives we task to act as change agents. We need a freer hand in disposing of outdated, unused, or little-used facilities. We need a freer hand in the management of existing facilities so facilities managers can adjust their use of resources to the changing needs of veterans. Bottom line, we at the VA are working hard to do our part. We've moved out smartly to aggressively tackle issues within our control. We've also demonstrated tremendous readiness and ability to affect fundamental organizational change. My VA is already making a difference in the veterans' experience of VA. Maybe someday we could hold a hearing on the My VA transformation. I would welcome that. But we can't continue making progress without reconciling requirements and resources, and we can't reconcile requirements and resources on our own. We need your help to do that. Veterans and the American people expect us to work together on their behalf, and we look forward to doing so. Thank you very much, Mr. Secretary. We intend to work with you, uh, and we will look at some of those issues that you have, you have just raised. And I've got a couple questions I'm going to ask you in just a few minutes uh, as well in reference to uh, legislative solutions and suggestions. Uh, Mr. Byrne, you're recognized for your testimony for five minutes. Chairman Miller, Ranking Brown, Member Brown, and distinguished members of the committee. Thank you for the opportunity to appear before you today. My name is Rich Byrne, and I represent the Mudder Corporation and our partners as the senior executive responsible for conducting the independent assessment as required by Section 201 of the Veterans Access Choice and Accountability Act of 2014. Now, before I get into the details, I'd like to acknowledge the many, many individuals, men and women throughout VA, who, did, who are deeply connected committed to the welfare of our nation's veterans and who unselfish, unselfishly supported the assessment in every way they could. We saw no hesitation for them to help us in any way. It was a privilege for every one of the team members to work on the assessment of this historic organization and on the nation's most complex health care system. Our assessment was conducted in partnership with the Rand Corporation, McKinsey and Company, and Grant Thornton, and supported by an independent blue ribbon panel composed of 16 top health care experts who reviewed our work to ensure that it incorporated the very best practices of the private sector. The assessment team visited 87 facilities, analyzed over 19,000 documents and data sets, and reviewed 137 previous assessments, and conducted over 1,000 VA interviews. We spoke with 10 veteran services organizations and 27 U.S. healthcare organizations. Our assessment presents a broad, independent, and evidence-based set of findings and recommendations. While overall VHA quality of care was comparable to private sector and had pockets of excellence, we found large variations in performance that resulted in too many unacceptable veteran experiences. This lack of consistency, we believe, was due to four pervasive systemic issues. Under governance, there was a disconnect in the alignment of demand, resources, and authorities. Under operations, there were uneven bureaucratic processes that were too often provider-centric, not patient-centric. And under data and tools, there were too many variations of non-standardized data and non-interoperable tools. And finally, under leadership, leaders were not fully empowered due to a lack of clear authority 
confusing priorities, and a culture of distrust. In reviewing the past 137 assessments of VHA, we found a number of findings that persisted year after year despite heroic efforts to resolve them. We concluded that these individual findings addressed individually did not then and will not now result in sustainable or scalable solutions. It is our belief that the only way to successfully transform VHA in an enduring manner is to address all of these four systemic issues using an integrated systems approach. Now, a systems approach would simultaneously build on improvements in all four of these four systemic areas in an integrated and consistent manner, independent of which finding we're going to address. Each solution would then build upon the previous solutions to increasingly improve the underlying root causes of the system that allows these anomalies and variations to happen. This will result in a sustainable and scalable solution. So taking the whole system perspective also supports reframing problems within a larger context, which in turn can lead to radically different, even transformational solutions with the potential to provide much greater value than simply improving the status quo. For example, if a hospital's construction is overrunning, in addition to looking at funding increases, it is critical to assess the four system cornerstones. So let's take an example of that. On the data, using accurate data, what is the veteran demographic demand for that hospital in that local area? Applying the appropriate governance for purchase care options for the private sector. Do we have to build the entire hospital for that demand, or are there excess capacity in the private sector? To streamline operations, what are the national productivity standards that should be targeted? And from leadership, how will health care be delivered in the future to incorporate trends like telehealth? Taken all together, these four cornerstones make you look at the problem of funding a specific facility in a bigger light. What is the future hospital that VA needs to build, not the one of the past? Together, these four system perspectives is what we believe is the secret to having enduring, scalable, sustainable solutions. Now, as one private sector doctor said, VHA is strong on anatomy, but weak on physiology. So what that means is it's clear that VHA has all the parts necessary to be a world-class provider. However, for all these parts to work smoothly together, it will take a significant transformation to build the collaboration inside and outside of VHA to create patient-centered operations led by empowered leaders who are informed by the right data and tools with the appropriate governance and resources to deliver on our nation's promise to our veterans. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Giroir. We recognize. Sure. Chairman Miller, Ranking Member Brown, members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to be here today. My name is Dr. Brett Giroir, and I am honored to serve as chair of the independent Blue Ribbon Panel created by MITRE to, su to provide support, oversight, and guidance for this independent assessment. The Blue Ribbon Panel was composed of 16 distinguished and outspoken independent experts whose names and biographies are listed in the integrated report. But briefly, the panel included the former CEOs of Kaiser Permanente, Geisinger, Healthcare Partners, and the California Healthcare Foundation, the former Executive VP of United Health, the Physician in Chief of Mass General Hospital, the former Surgeon General of the Army and Vice Chief of the Army, the world's leading academic experts in organizational change and health innovation, the CEOs of the National Quality Forum and the Texas Medical Center, the Dean of the Jefferson College of Nursing, a board member of the National Patient-Centered Outcomes Research Institute, and a former director of Medicare and Medicaid Services. Each Blue Ribbon panel, more importantly, shared a deep commitment to our veterans and nearly all had direct personal or family experiences with the VHA. Ultimately, the panel members unanimously endorsed the integrated report and its findings and recommendations. The report contains numerous near-term operational recommendations few of which were unexpected by anyone in this room. For example, enhanced physician productivity, a key element of enhancing access, will require more exam rooms, increased clinical support staff, improved patient scheduling, and greater authority granted to clinic directors for overall resourcing. But more importantly, the report also offers recommendations to solve deeper root cause issues that have persistently plagued the VHA and have prevented the successful implementation of reforms that were already suggested by the 137 previous VHA assessments. As Mr. Byrne has already testified, these root cause issues are the basis for four overarching recommendations in the area of governance, leadership, operations, and data and tools. Indeed, even the example I just gave 
of improving physician productivity appears straightforward, but would require reform of unnecessarily bureaucratic clinical staff hiring processes, which take three times as long as the private sector, empowerment of VA medical center leadership to flex resources to meet dynamic patient access needs, commitment to a modern electronic scheduling system that transparently indicates appointment availability to both schedulers and patients alike, and overhaul of the facility's construction and leasing processes that now cost twice as much as the private sector, but proceed at a pace that is two to threefold slower. I would also emphasize that one of the most urgent strategic priorities is to establish and clearly communicate the future mission of the VHA and for Congress to align resources and authorities to achieve that specific mission. As background in 2014, 9.1 million of 21.6 million U.S. veterans were enrolled in the VHA. Of these, 5.8 million were actual patients, and on average, these patients relied on the VHA for much less than 50 percent of their health care services. These demographic data, combined with access challenges, suggest reconsideration of whether the VHA should aim to be the comprehensive provider for all veterans' health needs, or whether the VHA should evolve into more focused centers providing specialized care while utilizing non-VHA providers for the majority of veterans' health care needs. Either paradigm could be highly beneficial to veterans as long as the demand and resources are prospectively aligned and there is a consolidation of current programs to simplify access to non-VHA providers. I also want to emphasize that although the report clearly outlines significant and longstanding problems, there are shining examples of emerging best practices at the VHA regional level that have improved access and quality and begun to change the overall organizational culture. Finally, on behalf of the panel, I would also like to express our appreciation to the hundreds of experts who contributed to this report and to the literally thousands of contributing veterans and VHA employees who believe that this report would become a roadmap to achieve the highest quality of care for veterans. I would also like to express our gratitude to this congressional committee for your support of veterans and our panel and for the opportunity to answer any questions related to our assessments and recommendations. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Giroir. I would like to uh, begin the questioning with you uh, on a point that you just just brought about up in your uh, both your written and your spoken testimony about the demographic data that the assessment collected. And I think that's a question that has been raised uh, in this hearing room many times uh, over the last year and a half. So I would ask you, given the choice of the two paradigms that you have discussed, one of which where VA aims to be a comprehensive provider of care for veterans service-connected and non-service-connected uh, care needs for, or one in which VA functions uh, as a coordinator of care focused primarily on being a center of excellence for specialized care, uh, which do you think that VA should pursue uh, and why do you think the way you do? Okay, well, this certainly is one of the, the key questions. The, the Blue Ribbon Panel clearly made a recommendation that veterans health care within our, each region needs to be evaluated by assessing both the VHA capabilities and the non-VHA capabilities, and that is clearly trending. Uh, the use of non-VHA providers, uh, both when care is unavailable or when it is more readily available, is something that is needs to continue and probably needs to expand. The Blue Ribbon Panel did not make an assessment of those, al of those two alternatives uh, in the extreme, but clearly uh, focuses on uh, the ability to expand integration with the private sector, because the VHA is no longer a siloed institution. It is part of an integrated healthcare network, and the veterans are telling you that with their, with their voting, with their voting with their feet. Uh, less than 50 percent of their health care, even among VHA patients, are received from the VHA, and as little as 15 percent of their outpatient appointments come from the VHA. So they are telling you that an integrated approach with the commercial sector is desirable and beneficial. Dr. Shulkin, could you comment just a little bit? I know it's at odds with, with the VA's approach, but do you differ uh, from 
uh, Dr. Chirois's assessment in regards to people voting with their feet? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I don't think that, that, that this differs from the VA approach. The VA approach is to find the very best care that serves the veterans. And I think that we've shown that in response to our access crisis that we have encouraged the use of community care to address our access issues. I think the difference here between uh, maybe what I would expand on what Dr. Giroir said is, is that the care that VA provides is very, very different than the care that the private sector provides. The VA provides a much more comprehensive approach than just dealing with physical illness issues. It provides psychological and social aspects of care that actually meet the needs of what veterans require. And that's why I think that we really do need to do what Dr. Giroir said, which is to see what VHA provides best for our veterans and what care can be provided by the private sector. And it's that hybrid type system that's going to meet our veterans' needs. So, Mr. Secretary, when you talk about the House passed budget being a cut, uh, effectively taking away health care from 70 plus thousand veterans, is that not what we tried to solve back last year with the Choice Program where we gave billions of dollars to provide? If you couldn't provide it inside the VA, you could provide it outside. But, you know, that, so it, it is, something doesn't match with the continued statement that the House passed budget is a cut that will harm veterans' health care. Uh, Mr. Chairman, as uh, Dr. Shulkin said, we are in favor of a hybrid system that takes advantage of all of our partners. Even before the CHOICE Act, we had many veterans who were going to our medical school affiliates, who were going to the Alaska Native Health System, who were going to the Indian Health System, who were going to joint DOD VA facilities. We're totally in favor of that. Right now in uh, Fort Benning, for example, uh, in Columbus, Georgia, we've got veterans going to Martin Army Hospital for 18 specialties that the VA doesn't provide. We're totally in favor of that, but here's the issue. As Dr. Girard mentioned, veterans today, we estimate, use the VA for only 34% of their health care. Every percentage point that they decide to use the VA more, that means we need an increase in budget of $1.4 billion. The federal budgeting process is not dynamic enough to take advantage of that. And what we've got is, is we've got veterans coming to VA because the care is better. In fact, a recent VA, a recent uh, VFW study showed that 82% of veterans prefer the VA and showed that 87% of veterans recommend the VA. So as that 34% gets higher, we've got to have the money to care for those veterans. When we put together the budget for 2016, we put together a budget that we thought would meet demand if we got the total budget amount and, as you recall, if we got budget flexibility to move money from one of the 70 line items to the other that we don't have that flexibility today. So this wasn't a, a, a question of trying to put money in coffers or in a bank. This is the demand that we see. And if we don't get that money, we won't be able to meet the demand at the requirements that we have. Importantly, in my statement, I said, if we want to work together to change the requirements, for example, 30 days appointments, maybe, maybe it doesn't need to be within 30 days. That's fine, but we've got to match requirements and budget at the same time. Well, I re would remind you that the 14-day and the 30-day were dates that VA set, not us. So, you well, know, we, as you know, we've eliminated the 14 days. I, I know, but I'm just, you know, I, if you need to change for budgetary reasons, I, I would understand that. You're also talking about increasing and requiring $1.4 or $5 billion. That number could also decrease as well. And I would tell the, the members here that the cut uh, to the president's request, uh, quote, is less than what we added to finish the Denver project. And with that, Ms. Brown, you're... Uh, Mr. Chairman, remember the cut also included a reduction in construction by 50 percent at a time when 60 percent of our buildings are over 50 years old. Ms. Brown. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'm going to yield most of my time to the secretary. But before, I, I want to thank um, the panelists that did the um, assessment. Um, but I, I want to mention that I think the um, elephant in the room is that there are people out there that would actually want to just completely close the VA. 
and privatize the entire VA system, which is totally unacceptable, and it is absolutely not what the veterans want. And as you begin, I want you to discuss flexibility, but I want you to let people know how many people we actually serve every day throughout this country. Well, th thank you, Ranking Member Brown. As I was going through my confirmation process, I often got the question from senators, uh, why, you know, from some senators, small group, why don't we get rid of the VA and just give out vouchers? So I studied that. As a business person, I wanted to know. And what I discovered was VA is not only essential for veterans, it's essential for American medicine, and it's essential for the American people. Three-legged stool, research. We spend $1.8 billion a year on research. We invented the nicotine patch. We were the ones who discovered the aspirin was important for heart disease, take an aspirin every day. First liver transplant, first implantable pacemaker. Last year, two VA doctors invented the shingles vaccine. I could go on. That research is important for the American people, and I didn't even mention post-traumatic stress or traumatic brain injury or prosthetics, things that we're known for. Second, training. We train 70% of the doctors in this country. Who's going to train those doctors without the VA? We are also the largest employer of nurses and the largest trainer of nurses. Third leg is clinical work. Our veterans get the best clinical care because our doctors are doctors that not only do the clinical care, but also do research and teach in the best medical schools of our country. So I think the American people benefit from the VA, and it would be a big mistake to even think about privatizing it. Would you expand on the flexibility as far as hiring and uh, the flexibility with your budget? Well, we talked this uh, in the last fiscal year. Flexibility for the budget is absolutely critical. We have 70, over 70 line items where we can't move money from one line item to the other, despite the fact that we've all agreed to give veterans choice. So the veterans have a choice, but we don't have the ability to move money where they decide to go to that choice. So as you know, last year we had to ask your permission to use care in the community money to pay for care in the community because that care in the community money was in the Choice Act funds, not in the, uh, the regular appropriation. So uh, flexibility is absolutely critical because we've given veterans choice. Uh, in, terms of the, in terms of pay and performance, uh, we've put together a, um, uh, some uh, requests for legislative help uh, one example is the 80-hour week that we're required by federal law to use, which is prohibiting our ability to hire doctors in emergency rooms. Um, there's no private sector medical system that has this requirement. As a result of that, we, we even had the VA outsourcing some of our emergency rooms, and that's just wrong. So uh, we need that legislation passed in order to free up our ability to hire the people we need. Uh, did you want to, uh, I have another minute there, 19 seconds. Did you want to add to that? Well, I, I, I've, I passed along a letter to you and to the chairman on September 8th detailing the legislative uh, requests, uh, including the 2016 budget. Obviously, operating under a continuing resolution is going to be terrible for us. It means no new programs. It means no way of meeting this increasing demand that we're seeing. Uh, budget flexibility for the future, we talked about that. Uh, thank you for your work on the Denver hospital construction. Uh, provider agreement legislation, we have, um, we have veterans' homes right now um, deciding not to renew their contracts with us because our provider uh, agreement legislation is not clear. Um, so that's a problem. We need to streamline and consolidate our care in the community, which uh, we're going to have a proposal to you before the 1st of November. Uh, I need help in West Los Angeles. Uh, Senator Feinstein has put, it, put together a, a marvelous bill. The Senate held a hearing this week to allow us to get into extended use agreements with providers to build housing on that campus that we could use as bridge housing or supportive housing for homeless veterans. And we all want to end homelessness in Los Angeles. There are several other pieces of legislation I've requested, but I think every member has this letter, and we would appreciate your hard work on this. Thank you. And we will help. I yield back. Thank you very much, Mr. Secretary. I, I do look forward to working with you on the, on the Los Angeles issue, and I hope you will be looking at the enhanced use leases that are on that property that probably shouldn't be on that property. 
uh, for whatever reason, and I know that there is a significant amount of turmoil uh, going on out there right now. This should be about veterans. That's what the property was donated for, and I think that's what this committee and that's what the VA should expect. Absolutely right, Mr. Chairman. We've already sent out letters of uh, notice of eviction to uh, many of those users. Many or all? Many, because again, it depends what value veterans are getting from that, the presence of that, um, that provider, that partner on the property. We can go through that in greater detail if you like. Okay, and the other thing, you talked about budget flexibility. I'm, I'm waiting for language uh, from you in regards to budget. You, you've talked about it for a long time, but we haven't received anything from you. We asked for it uh, probably 30 days ago. Uh, we still haven't gotten anything from you and would like to, you know, if, if you really want budget flexibility, send us some language that you want us to work on. we Will do, Mr. Chairman. Okay, Mr. Lamborn, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I want to thank all the people who put this assessment together. Uh, I want to thank the VA for cooperating and working so hard to help get the re assessment done also. And Mr. Chairman, thank you for your work in bringing us to this point. Uh, Secretary McDonald, I have a really specific question I want to ask you, a local question, and then broaden to a general and a national question. But first of all, I see in your written statement that you referenced a potential lack of funding for four major construction projects and six cemetery projects. Since the cemetery project in my district is already well under design, is it still on track for construction funding in 2017? And will a funding shortfall in any way impact the Southern Colorado cemetery construction? Uh, thank you for the question, Congressman Lamborn. Uh, those six would be new cemeteries. The project in Colorado would be okay. Okay. All right. Uh, then let me broaden to a larger, more general question, but very vital. I believe that access to care and streamlining community care are critical, and we've talked a lot about that this morning already. Are you on track to deliver the new Veterans Choice Program by November 1st, 2015, as promised? Uh, I would say we're making progress. Uh, in fact, uh, the, the authorizations um, climb by multiples every month. But I would say, just like we talked about variability in the VA system, there will be variability. Uh, I was with Dave McIntyre last night of TriWest, for example. Uh, it's going to take us a while to build capability in some of the geographies where, not surprisingly, there's a shortage of primary care physicians or mental health physicians. Um, but we are working it as hard as we possibly can. And I'm, I'm hopeful and I believe that the consolidation of all the programs will make choice even more effective. Why? Because we'll go to one program that our employees have to administer and the veterans will only have one program for outside care. So um, I think it will simplify things dramatically. Okay, thank you. And Dr. Girard, I hope I pronounced that correctly. One of the things that you referenced of the many that need uh, reform or improvement is physician productivity. Uh, what are your specific recommendations in that very critical area? I mean, we could talk about so many things, and I know we will during the rest of this hearing, but that's one I'd like to drill down on. Th thank you for that question. If you take the top line uh, that, for example, VHA primary care physicians have 14% fewer patients or that the specialists are much below the 50th percentile in productivity, the immediate potential response might be, well, get the physicians to work harder. But it's a much more complicated problem, as I outlined. There needs to be improved clinic space. That improved clinic space implies, though, that the VA has the authorities to make leases in less than six to nine years to do that. It means that hiring a nurse doesn't take six months or eight months or nine months. It takes two months like it does in the private sector because you lose those people. Um, it re also requires scheduling. Uh, imagine if your calendar was on six different separate screens depending on whether the person was a constituent, a non-constituent, a member. Well, that's sort of the scheduling system that we found in many of the VAs, which makes it impossible to understand what the physician's real schedule is going to be. So I think on the near term, these are the kinds of issues that can promote productivity even within the system and enhance the, the, uh, the job satisfaction among not only the physicians and the staff, but again, as Mr. Byrne said, 
uh, think of all those cornerstones, leadership, governance, operations, and data and tools, and I think this is one example of them, and hopefully that answered your question to some degree, sir. Well, it really helps, and that's something I'll work with you. I know that all of us here have a Dr. Rowe, and everyone here has a concern about that specific area, Dr. Uh, uh, from Ohio, and we all we all want to we all want to work with you on this. I mean, this is so critical. So I'll work with Brad, and uh, thank you. And I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you, Mr. Tacano. You're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, uh, Mr. Secretary, do you agree uh, with something I've read in the report that uh, the systems overhauls, the systems based overhauls uh, described in the report could take at least five to 10 years to take hold? Are we looking at that? No, I mean, first of all, it's already underway. Okay. Um, second of all, um, you know, while, we, while Congress demanded this assessment, and this assessment cost $68 million from our budget, $68 million, uh, I had done my own assessment when I took over my own root cause analysis. I've done this before, and uh, we're on track with many of the same things. Uh, I appreciate the depth of the analysis. Uh, I can't do that myself. Um, but these things are already underway, and, and we're already seeing results. Uh, we wouldn't have had 7 million more completed appointments uh, if we didn't put in 1.8 million more square feet of space, if we didn't put in over 1,400 new providers, if we didn't put in over 3,000 new nurses. So progress is being made. Well, my, my concern is that if it were true, um, I've seen the turnover in this committee, uh, the, uh, uh, and the turnover within the administration. We have one year left of this administration. The changing administrations, regardless of who the next, uh, which, which party will occupy the White House, uh, that part of the problem is the institutional memory. And uh, you mentioned you didn't agree with the uh, idea of the commission, that you think see this committee and the Senate committee as the, uh, and I agree with you, but uh, I think both parties need to be committed to constituting these committees with people that are going to stay here uh, and to, and to uh, work with the department uh, even as uh, the top positions uh, well, The change. chairman and I have said publicly, and I, please correct me if I'm misquoting you, that we have a unique moment in time right now where we have tremendous unanimity uh, between the two parties, between the House and the Senate, and we have a new leadership team at the VA. Thirteen of my top leaders are all new. Thirteen. We've got the transformation underway. The work that was done by the independent assessment is incredibly helpful because of the depth of analysis. I think we just join arms and we do it, and we create irreversible momentum uh, in, in this transformation. Mr. Secretary, I was disappointed to learn that the DOD let out the contract, a, a several billion dollar contract for uh, health IT, uh, and that there's still no commitment uh, for it to sync up with with Vista. Well, their, their, their contract has as a provision that it has to be interoperable with VA. Uh, it, oh, so there is a provision. There is contract. a provision for that, and we're working very closely with them on that. Uh, we have so many joint DOD VA facilities now. There's no turning back on this. We've got to have an interoperable. Okay, well, that's a, that's a relief to know. I mean, I've, I've been fretting about the fact that that contracts and have been let out. We would, I'd be happy to send a team of people to your office and have them show you the interoperability. I, I would be very pleased to learn more about what you're doing. Um, the report also talks about, uh, points out that many feel that uh, in this area, uh, what, which, what, what was once uh, VA's crown jewel has been allowed to stagnate and now 85% of VA's IT budget is now going to the maintenance of VISTA. Um, uh, you know, past efforts to update HIT, uh, health IT, particularly achieving interoperability with DOD, have been mired with problems. What lessons can we learn from past efforts uh, to ensure that we're on a successful uh, pathway to create a comprehensive system able to seamlessly operate with DOD? To me, it all starts and third, with... And the third-party providers that we want to do with yes. community care. Well, that's absolutely critical. I mean, we've got to have interoperability with DOD, but the interoperability with the private sector is absolutely critical because we, we do agree that there will be times where veterans will go outside VA for care. So that interoperability becomes critical. It starts with getting the right leader in place. We now have the right leader in place. Laverne Council... Uh, who has been the head of IT at Johnson & Johnson at Dell. She knows how to do this. She's very good. She's all over it. Number two is we've got to, we've got to take on the big systems. Our financial management system, which ran into problems last, last uh, year, last fiscal year, was written in COBOL. 
COBOL is a language I wrote at West Point in 1971-72. Nobody, you can't even find people writing COBOL. Now, the chairman will bring up, I'm sure, that we've tried twice before to replace that system and failed. I'm telling you we can replace that system and we have the leadership to do it. The scheduling system, which was properly brought up in 1985, dates to 1985, we've put in 11 patches, but they're just patches. We need to overhaul the system. We need a new system, uh, as, uh, as the doctor brought up. So we have a lot of systems work to do. We need the budget to do it, and I'll get you the right people to do it, and we'll get it done. Well, this is very heartening testimony, Mr. Secretary. And I, Mr. Chairman, I look forward to hearing what he has to say about simplifying our ability to do community care with private providers. Thank you very much, Mr. DeCano. And I think that you know, there, there's two words, uh, interoperability, and that sounds great, and integration. Uh, and and inter you know, the integration of the system is the thing that is so critical. Uh, and, and I can understand maybe not integrating the private sector, but for DOD to continually be the, the agency that is pushing back over billions of dollars that have been spent, I mean, it's not helping. And, and even when Congress orders it to be done, it doesn't get done. And we, we want to help the VA, and we understand that you're not the one that's causing the problem. I'm, I'm happy to put on a, a, a display, a demonstration for the committee so you all can see what we've achieved. In the end, it's all ones and zeros, and that's why the interoperability is relatively easy to do. Um, but we're happy to demonstrate how, it for you. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Bilirakis. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate it. Uh, I think Mr. Lamborn mentioned about the, uh, the physicians, what have you, uh, and one of you testified with regard to medical scribes. Uh, why don't we have medical scribes uh, available to all our VA physicians? Um, you know, I hear from my veterans, and they say that the, 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 the doctor really wants to treat them, and uh, you know, they still have to uh, scribe, and, and it takes so much time away from the patient. Uh, yeah, uh, Congressman, uh, I think as you're suggesting, um, the issue of taking physician time away to spend on doing That's entry into, a, into a medical record is a problem. It's a problem in VA. It's a problem throughout the healthcare industry. We are seeing practices, particularly in the private sector, of using scribes, something that I'm very familiar with. And we actually are beginning in different areas of the VA to begin to take a look at this as an option. I think it is a viable option that we're exploring. It's obviously an expensive option, and given the size of VA, we're taking a hard look at that because using resources appropriately is certainly very important to us. But it is an area that we are trying to lessen the time that physicians are spent entering information into records and more time with, with their patients. And the scribe system is certainly one of those avenues we're looking at. I appreciate that. As, as you David says, we're, we're, we're testing, we're piloting the scribe. The flip side of the argument, just so everybody understands both sides, is if we simplify the medical record enough so that the alerts that come up uh, really help the doctor, and, and you know, you want the doctor interfacing with that record to see those alerts rather than a scribe who may not be sufficiently medically trained to understand what those alerts do. So we have to work both sides of the equation. Thank you. Um, in your test testimony, Mr. Uh, Secretary, uh, you mentioned that this independent assessment reinforced the VA's own uh, analysis. Uh, has there been a, an, have you done an independent, has the VA done an independent assessment of their own? Well, we have. In fact, uh, in my first few weeks in position, I traveled to as many facilities as possible. I've now been to over 220 facilities, and that has fed the information into our transformation plan. Uh, I shared it with the chairman uh, within my first couple of weeks. You might recall it was a high-performance organization model. I shared it with the President of the United States, and that's what led to the 90-day plan called the Road to Veterans Day and also to the My VA transformation and the five strategies of My VA. Would you be willing to share it uh, with us? And, and sure, absolutely. Well? It's, it's, it's only two pages long. It's not uh, 4,000 pages, and it didn't cost $68 million. Okay, well, I appreciate us taking a look at it. Uh, we really would. I think we'd get a lot out of that. Uh, was there anything that VA's assessment discovered that was not included in the independent assessment? 
I think uh, what I would argue is my assessment was more about leadership and culture. It became very clear to me that I needed a new leadership team. Um, Jim Collins, who's a friend of mine, likes to say you got to get the right people on the bus and get them in the right seats on the bus. Um, the assessment talked a lot about leadership, but uh, very specifically, I needed a new leadership team. Secondly, I spent a lot more time about the culture. What do I need to change the culture? I called out two things. One called design thinking. Design thinking is a uh, technique that's used to design delightful consumer experiences. And I can go into more detail of the training that we did two weeks ago or a week ago on that. Secondly, uh, Lean Six Sigma and training Lean Six Sigma. Think about design thinking as the way you design the experience for the consumer. Think about Lean Six Sigma as the way you improve productivity of what's backstage, what the, what the consumer doesn't see. Thank you. Uh, last question. Uh, uh, VA's presentation to the Commission on Care two weeks ago stated that uh, VHA has begun to work on many of the 188 recommendations that were included in the assessment, the independent assessment. Which of the assessments, many recommendations have you been working on uh, uh, and prioritized? If you can give me some specific examples. Uh, uh, Congressman, I'd be glad to do that. I I think that uh, in addition to what the Secretary said, uh, VHA has also had its own strategic plan called the Blueprint for Excellence. That was uh, created uh, after the Phoenix crisis, and Dr. Jonathan Perlin came in for a period of time to help with VHA to create its own strategic plan. So we have been hard at work in many of these areas that actually fit very nicely, align with the recommendations uh, that were identified in the independent assessment. They they have to deal with these exact issues, how we, how we prioritize our data, how we essentially address our leadership issues, how we engage our staff and improve morale and improve our hiring practices, how we ensure consistency and best practices across the system, something that, that uh, both Mr. Byrne and, and Dr. Gouar, uh, Gouar, uh identified today. So these are all issues that VHA is hard at work at. I didn't say that we've done all 188, but that we have begun work on the vast majority of these, and we are going to use this independent assessment and what comes out of the Commission on Care to make sure that we're refining those appropriately. Thank you very much. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Uh, the Secretary keeps reminding us that uh, we've invested one, uh, $63 million or thereabouts for the... Uh, $68 million. Okay. Uh, I would like to remind the members that we just raised the cap on the Denver Hospital of $1.675 billion. Sir, it's not a hospital. It's a, it's a complex of about uh, 16 buildings. It's a massive cost overrun and screw up. And we agree with that. Thank you. Ms. Titus. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Maybe we should have used this $68 million to apply to that hospital. They're probably going to need it before it's over with. That's what worries me. Thank you, Mr. Secretary, for being here. It's always a pleasure to see you. Uh, I just want to begin by taking exception to the doctor's blanket statement that veterans are voting with their feet by going to the private sector. I think that's a spurious conclusion. I think some of those veterans are going to the private sector not because they want to, but because they have to, because they can't get the services, can't get the appointment, don't live close enough to a facility, but they prefer the VA. And that kind of brings me to my general point. I made this on the floor last week that I'm worried about how the VA and how Congress are funding the uh, needed health care for our veterans. Uh, last week, as you heard many times, we voted to fund the construction of the Denver facility. Now, I know it's a good facility. I'm not questioning the importance of it. Excuse me. I'm not questioning the importance of it. All veterans everywhere need care, but when we are talking about paying for it, we are just moving around the deck chairs. We're not saving the ship, I'm afraid. Uh, we're waiting for the specific recommendations of how the VA is going to move that money around, but what I've seen so far is pretty troubling. We are robbing Peter to pay Paul, and two of the points have come up this morning. You mentioned the COBOL antiquated language of computers and IT problems, or, or IT problems, but one of the recommendations for paying for Denver is taking a about $50 million out of the IT 
budget. Um, you've also mentioned that you're going to propose cutting funding for retention and recruitment programs, and yet one of the recommendations and one of the problems that's seen is that we cannot hire enough doctors even enough, much less the best and brightest, and that our hiring process is much longer than you find in the private sector. I talked to the head of the uh, medical facility in Las Vegas, and he said they had run out of this money. They need more money, not less, as an incentive to get the professionals there. Now, I'm not just blaming the VA. I think Congress is at fault, too. You mentioned that these short-term CRs are not helpful. Certainly, I think they're irresponsible. Um, and also, we have these arbitrary caps that don't make any sense. They don't allow us to accommodate future needs. Uh, you know, maybe we should just put the VA in the OCO account. That seems to be where everybody wants to put the money. But I'd like to ask you, how important is it to get a real appropriations bill? I mean, and also, do you think you'll be coming back to us with another crisis situation? We're going to have to close down hospitals if we can't move this money around or we can't get some more money. Give us kind of a projection for that. Well, I hate to predict a crisis, but remember the rate at which we're tr with these new um, hepatitis C drugs, which are curing hepatitis C for the first time without the side effects that occurred previously. Remember, uh, veterans have a higher incidence of hepatitis C than non-veterans. We are trying to cure all of those veterans with hepatitis C. That's what helped create the budget crisis of the last fiscal year. That that demand for the hepatitis C drug is not going to abate because suddenly it's October 1st. Right. So the continuing resolution is obviously not sufficient to be able to continue on the path we were on in order to treat the, the hepatitis C. That's just one example. The other example, of course, is as you said, I said earlier, on average, 34 veterans are using the VA for 34% of their care. 78% of veterans have a choice, TRICARE, private health insurance, Medicare, VA. They choose VA because of the care. That's what the VFW study said. 82% um, 80, uh, choose VA, 87% recommend VA. If that 34% number continues to rise, which it appears to be doing as more people are coming into the system as the care improves, then we have a real budget problem. And, and the dynamic, this, the, the budgeting the way we do it isn't going to work. It's not the way a business would do it. I mean, we started the budget for 2016 two years ago. The drug was invented in two, you know, between the time we started the budget and the time the budget's actuated. So that becomes a problem. We need a more dynamic system. We also need to do a better job forecasting, and that's on us. And then the inflexibility causes us to end the year with pockets of underspending where if we could aggregate all of those funds together, we could make sure that they were all spent on behalf of veterans. But because this particular fund isn't maybe needed and we don't want to go over, we always underspend. Uh, in business, you tend to aggregate funds so that you spend all the money that you've, that you've appropriated. And I worry about the personnel for the uh, appeal system. You talked about the need for personnel for the original backlog, but you've got over 300,000 appeals in the system right now, and that number is going to grow too. It is. We're working right now to re-engineer that process. We'll need some new legislation. We've been working with the veteran service organizations on something called the fully developed appeal that will uh, accelerate the process, but we need more people, and those people are in the budget proposal. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Dr. Rowe. You're right. uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and also thank the committee for all the work you all have done. Um, I'm going to pass along a little wisdom I got from an old GP when I started my practice many decades ago. He said, son, he said, you need to follow the three A's of the practice of medicine. One is availability, which the VA has flunked. Two is affability. Do, do they like you once they get in? And third is your ability. And I think one of the things we ought to talk about, and I'm going to bring up some issues that came up with uh, my veterans person at home and walk you all through down at the ground level, not at the 30,000 foot level where we've been. On um, productivity, I had a colonoscopy a couple of weeks ago. The two docs I went to see in the private sector, a nine iron from over at the VA, do, do 30 to 40 per day. 
you would overwhelm a VA anywhere if they thought they had to do 30. And this was just a routine day for these guys in private practice. And you talk about scribes, my goodness, hiring a six-figure doctor to make them 15 or 20 percent more productive with a 12 or 13 dollar an hour employee makes perfectly good sense. Almost every private doctor you see now are shifting to that. It's an added cost to them, but it allows the most uh, skilled person in the healthcare system to stay productive and let, let that data entry go to somebody who's of a lower skill. And I think you're going to have to switch to that it, it, to make up the difference. There are just not enough doctors in America with the current system. It slowed me down by about 25 or 30 percent, the electronic health record did. I tried to speed up. I would used everything I could. I just couldn't do it. And on facilities, um, I think you need to be innovative. We had a facility in our area where a local hospital had been vacated, and they leased that to the VA for a dollar a year. Uh, we need to be looking at innovative ways like that. And one of the things it said in the report, and by the way, this was a fantastic job that was done, was that the capital requirements uh, over the next decade, the funding levels are two to three times more than the funding levels are. And then it goes down two bullet points later and says VA construction costs are slimmer, similar to other public agencies, but double the private industry best practices. And VA's time to complete exceeds both the public and private other private sectors. So you may have enough money if you can just get it done on time and use those other things. So I would point that out. Now let me go right to what I wanted to talk about which is my, my own veterans officer at home, person that does my work at home. And basically what she's saying is, how do you get an appointment through the Veterans Choice Program? She said she had been trying to put together a summary, and what's happening is there are two ways you get in there. A veteran can either be eligible uh, by a 30-day wait list or more than 40 miles. And the most of the problems she saw were the 30-day list. And this is what happens. Below is the information that's been given to me by the rollout of the program. In my experience, there appears to be a breakdown somewhere in this process, but I've been unable to cl get clear answers on how to fix it. The VA blames Tri-West, Tri-West blames the VA. Eligibility is determined by the VA primary care doctor if the appointment's mm -hmm. past 30 days. The non-VA care staff then uploads this list of eligible veterans to the VA central office here in Washington nightly. And the veteran's told to wait five to seven days and then call Tri-West. The central office then sends the information to Tri-West can take three to seven days. Con uh, the, if the, cons the consults don't get added, medical documentation didn't get uploaded, authorizations gets canceled, then the veteran's on a merry-go-round. Look, when they <laughs> came to my office to get an appointment, I said, you need an appointment with Dr. Smith. They went out front and made the appointment. That's what should happen. Ain't that complicated? And, and all of this in between, and I can go on on Try west has a different view of it. I want to submit this to the record because it really gets to the bottom of what's Without actually objection. going. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The, the non-VA care staff were given no training uh, on this, and they basically were left just to wing it, when, how to make these appointments. That was one of the things that was brought up in the report. Our local VA care, non-VA care staff increased from 5 to 15 but still are struggling to make all these appointments. And there's talk of, and listen to this right here, there's talk of calling each patient for every appointment to make sure they keep it. If the patient says, I don't want to go, they still are told to call them two times a month till past the appointment time. That's a complete waste of time. And the outpatient clinics uh, also ought to be able to add patients to the electronic wait list instead of, instead of sending them over because appointment may come up. Veterans get left out like that. And the Tri-West portal is not very friendly. Private doctors do not like jumping through all the hoops of the choice program or saying they must give up percent of their fee to Tri-West in order for Tri-West to file the claim. So our, we have a clinic that's closing in our office, in our VA, on a chiropractic and pulmonary clinic because the doctors are just fed up with the way the system is. It's so bureaucratic. So anyway, I, I could go on and on. This is very extensive. This is on-the-ground stuff that's going on today at our medical center, and I bet you it's going on around the country. And I think these are things I will submit to you so you can get to work on this. And again, appreciate the effort that you put into it. But Mr. Chairman, there's some valuable information here for the VA to use. I Thank you. Go back. Ms. Brown, you had a question. Yeah, I, I do, because I, I want the Secretary to answer that. Because I think it's, I'm meeting with Tri-West today. But the important thing is you can't send a veteran to a uh, agency or anywhere until they get prior approval from the VA because the most important thing is that that doctor get that reimbursement. So can you clear this up? I mean, no person in my office can send someone to a doctor. It must go through the system so that 
you get prior approval. And once that's done, how long? why does it take so long for that physician to get reimbursed? And can he answer that question? We, we have, um, we have flow charted that process, and let me let David talk about the improvements that we've made to that process. He'll answer questions one and three, and I'll take two on the facilities. Okay. Uh, Dr. Rowe, I think your old adage on the three A's is exactly right. And um, you have to remember, uh, we brought this choice system up in 90 days. This is a national, very complex system. And what we've heard after bringing it up in 90 days is exactly the type of feedback that you've been hearing from your constituents. The secretary and I are both out in the field. We understand that these problems are happening. And so what we've begun to do is to redesign the system and to process map it out. Both the secretary and I spoke to the CEO of TriWest last evening, and we are beginning now to make outbound calls to the veterans before they had to call in. We are beginning to actually embed TriWest staff in the VA so that they're working in teams and we're beginning to start eliminating some of those steps. It is going to take a while. Uh, it is painful to watch this when you hear stories like what you're hearing, but we understand the problems there. We are working very hard. We think TriWest and HealthNet are working to help us make this system better and we're committed to doing this with urgency. Relative to uh, facilities, we, we agree with your comment. In fact, um, one of the things we've talked with Rich about is, is figuring out how we can come up with a total system map that includes all the DOD facilities, all the VA facilities, uh, Indian Health Service, uh, medical school affiliates, so we can better understand where do we need to invest, where are the gaps where we need to invest where facilities don't exist. With the drawdown in, uh, in the wars in the Middle East, what we're finding is DOD has a lot of capacity that we can use. Martin Army Hospital is an example I used earlier, but there are many examples of where we're working together with DOD so that we can use the same facilities. Uh, if you look at the, the space that we've been doing over the past year or so, we've been leasing more space uh, than we've been building. Uh, almost to a factor of two to one. So, I mean, that's going to continue to be the case as, because we've got to be more flexible to meet the demand where the demand goes. Thank you. Mr. O'Rourke. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and to the ranking member for uh, organizing today's hearing and to the uh, panelists for, for joining us. Um, I, I want to get back to a question that was raised earlier about uh, the role of the VA system going forward, and a question raised by Miter and uh, uh, Dr. Giraud, the, the letter that you signed to the Secretary on September 1, uh, suggesting that it is worth looking into whether or not the VA should focus on specific areas of service-related conditions. And in some of the things that we've heard from the Secretary about the 34 percent utilization rate today, and that for each additional percent of utilization it costs the VA uh, I think $1.4 billion was, was the number that we got from you. And that's 34% is just of those veterans who are currently uh, eligible, I mean enrolled, uh, doesn't include all eligible, which I believe is, is 9 million, or all veterans uh, in the country over, over 20 million. So, so from a fiscal perspective, it's, it's hard to make the case that the VA should provide all care to all veterans all the time. I just don't know how we could do it fiscally. I think there are some very serious operational concerns that are self-evident to, to everyone here. And then on the moral dimension, we really have a crisis in mental health care. When officially we know that 22 veterans a day are taking their own lives, and most veterans organizations uh, that I've spoken to think the real numbers is certainly much higher than that. And when we know that care delayed becomes care denied, uh, turns into tragic outcomes for veterans and their families. I want to ask you and Mr. Byrne and the secretaries uh, about the, uh, this question of prioritization. Um, should we be prioritizing in the 41,000 funded but unhired positions within VHA, mental health providers? Should the VA become a center of excellence, as I think is suggested in, in the MITRE report, or one of the issues that we should look at, so that perhaps 100% of eligible veterans who have 
post-traumatic uh, post stress disorder, are suffering from the consequences of traumatic brain injury, have military sexual trauma, have uh, traumatic um, amputations or other significant combat and service-related conditions, they go to the VA because it's a center of excellence, there are no access issues, and we've prioritized hiring and resources there. And when we refer people out into the community, uh, we refer them out for conditions that are comparable to what the general population has, whether that is diabetes or the flu or uh, someone looking at audiology or your feet or uh, any number of other conditions that are comparable. T tell me, uh, I'll start with you, Dr. Giro, what, what's wrong with that conclusion and, and why uh, the commission uh, has not reached that uh, already? Well, thank you for the question, and there were so many uh, statements that we do support very strongly what you said. Uh, among the first, the, the first point, I, I think it's, it goes back to aligning resources with demand, and the VA in some, in some aspects is an impossible situation because the demand could literally double overnight uh, depending on how, the, on how uh, the services are provided and the demand for the veterans. And that's an impossible situation to plan for X, 2X, or 3X, and you know the numbers as we outline them. So to specifically define what the VA is going to do to fund it specifically for that and to provide other sources of care for, for the remaining is, is the main point. We have to align demand with resources, however that's defined, and it can be done two or three different ways. They can all work, but you need to pay. Is, is some demand more important than other demand? So if a veteran is coming back from Afghanistan with post-traumatic stress disorder and so, cannot get in to see a mental health so, care provider, isn't that more important? So, so I, I'm not going to say more important, but what I will say, which is the essence of your, of your question, sir, is, is the panel, the Blue Ribbon panel does feel, and I think it is true, that there is care for these kinds of specific issues, post-traumatic stress disorder, traumatic brain injury, traumatic amputation, severe burns and injuries, that nobody on the planet does it as good as the VA. Right. And it needs to be comprehensive care, not just in the operating room, but all the social services, the mental services, the comprehensive provider care that needs to be done. And, and certainly, at, at the essence, uh, that is something the VA uh, among all things needs to be preserved for. Whether the VA should take care of every patient with hypertension or diabetes or other issues is a question that needs to be resolved by, by the governance. But clearly those core issues are something that our veterans rely on, will rely on, and the future injuries of war that we cannot predict, the VA must always be there for that, in, in our opinion. I, I'm out of time, so I'll have to follow up with the other panelists at a, at a future date, but it would certainly love to sit down and talk with each of you and get your responses to that. We look better. forward to that opportunity. We have eight classifications today that help sort through some of that, and we'd love to sit down and go through it with you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Dr. Abraham, you are now recognized for five minutes. Secretary McDonald, uh, we'll start with you, sir. You've said um, on multiple occasions that you want the VA to be run as a business. Uh, you, being of a business background with Tide and Procter and Gamble, uh, know that certainly the VA could be a more efficient uh, entity uh, if it were run in a business model. I want to reference, you said that you were somewhat opposed to the govern government's board uh, having some oversight of the VA. Why would you be opposed to that, sir? I'm not opposed to a board as such. In fact, I even set up an external advisory board, which is uh, loaded just like the Blue Ribbon panel with experts to help advise me. Uh, the reason I did that was I was disappointed that I've attended lots of committee hearings, but nobody wanted to talk about the transformation of VA. We were talking about problems that occurred in the past. So I do see the role of the board, but, but my thought is that if, 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 you, if you as Congress really decide you need this board, isn't that an abrogation of your responsibilities? Can't we, I think with the chairman that we have, with the committees that we have, with the unanimity of purpose that we have, we can do this ourselves without needing a separate board? And we want you to do it yourself. Uh, well, no, we, I mean, we want the I, proof I need your help. Well, but we understand. But again, we don't want to abrogate our authority or our responsibility. Absolutely. But we want you to do what you're paid to do and, and herd your people into the right direction and make this VA system a better system. Like Dr. Rowe, we 
are back in the districts uh, on a, almost a weekly basis, either on the weekends or during the week. And we're, you know, our veterans really aren't feeling the love, so to speak. I mean, we are still having some massive issues. And you go across anywhere in the United States, and these same issues come up and up. Dr. Shulkin, I'll also reference Dr. Rowe on these uh, scribes. I've used scribes for years, and I understand the alert uh, deal, but let me tell you, they work, uh, and they work very well, and you, as a physician, can increase productivity at least by 30 to 40 percent if you have a scribe that is knowledgeable just in the system. His other point with the three A's, his first one was availability. Uh, I, another novel idea, and I'm sure you guys have thought about it, if you expand hours of your VA clinics, I assure you as being a director of a multi-doctor practice, there are, will be nurses and doctors that stand in line that will take that 5 p.m. to 11 p.m. shift if they have children, if they have a spouse that works. And again, you're using just the same facility and just getting more efficiency out of that. So again, you know, these are ideas that, uh, go ahead. Sir, sir. Well, I would just say that our, our uh, RVU productivity is up 8%, okay. over 8%. On a budget increase of about 2.8 percent. All right, now let me interrupt and you. And extended there. hours is one of the reasons. And I know Dr. Winstrup on my right here, he has referenced this RVU uh, situation before. Now, are we to the point now where you can give us an RVU number? Yes. Okay, excellent. And uh, David can talk more detail about RVU. Please. Yeah, yeah I, I mean, I think all your points are excellent, uh, Congressman. Um, we are we are actually doing many of the things that you've talked about. As the Secretary mentioned, we've extended hours, we've, in, we've improved productivity on the RVU basis approximately 8%, but many of our specialties uh, well above that as well. And we are looking at issues like, like the scribe. But what we want to do is to take the independent assessments recommendation and look at these as system issues rather than pushing on And one I understand that. And, you know, right. Mr. Byrne gave the four cornerstones yep. of the, uh, what, what his assessment say, uh, said. And if you look at them, I mean, that's just basic business 101. I mean, it, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to, to figure this stuff out. What we're asking you guys to do is take it to heart and actually do it. Uh, while we've got just a, a few seconds left, uh, Secretary, do you now have the power has, have we as Congress empowered you now to be, you talking about changing culture. Well, the one way to change culture is to fire some people that aren't doing their job. Do you have that power now to do that? Uh, yes, we've, we've terminated over 2,100 people uh, since I became secretary. And that's actually firing. That's just not retiring. That's that. That's, uh, well, it's, that's it's terminations. It, it's terminations. It includes some people who are on a probationary status where we didn't hire them afterwards. Um, but I think, you know, if, if you want to look for uh, points of accountability, let's talk about a gentleman named Cathedral Henderson in Augusta, Georgia, who, um, you know, is, is, is now uh, has um, 50 counts of falsifying uh, consult records, each one carrying a potential fine of $250,000, and in total potentially looking at five years in jail, he's uh, going to trial. So um, I, I'm... You know, while I would like to do it faster, we are holding people accountable. We're using all the um, forces at our ability, whether it's the Office of Special Counsel, IG, or in this case, the FBI. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Waltz, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Ranking Member for holding this. Thank each of you uh, for your citizenship, for being involved in this. This is not going to be fixed by Congress. It's not going to be fixed just by the administration. Uh, it's going to be fixed by citizens uh, demanding and using our best and brightest to figure out a way to do this. So I, for one, am grateful. And, and Mr. Secretary, thank you. And I'm glad to hear you say, while not totally accurate, some of us have been asking to have this conversation on long-term systemic change. I brought up many times the idea we had a quadrennial defense review that drove policy, strategy, and budgeting from that. We never had such a thing on the VA, and so I think it's really heartening. I appreciate all the work that was went into this. Um, I, I think hearing from Dr. Rowe sounds like he did just what we talked about, Mr. Secretary. We kind of did a, uh, a post-mortem on someone's experience and those folks out there. So I'll, I hear Tri West a lot, keep health net in mine too on this. I know you do. And I'm, I'm grateful for that. Um, 
I wanted to come back where Dr. Abraham was because I thought this was an interesting point, Mr. Secretary, of, of all the recommendations. And in full disclosure, I always say this because I, it certainly influences my decision. I represent Mayo Clinic area, so I look at how Mayo Clinic's model is desert, on, on outcomes. And this idea of the recommendation of a non-governmental entity, um, I looked at that and tried to understand it. But I, I kind of think that I agree with where Ms. Dr. Abraham was talking about, you have a job to do, we hired you to do it. The public hired us to do a job, too. I'm a little bit uncomfortable, too, putting someone between us and them. I'm just not sure we have the resources or if we've done it well enough. So I'd kind of like to get each of your, because I know this board concept is, it, it's with Mayo, it's with Kaiser and all of that, and I know that's where it came from. I have over 25 special advisory committees today, 25. Uh, I like uh, the statement Jack Welch used when he talked about GE. We're trying to reduce levels and layers. Uh, we're working very hard at that. That's why we've not filled a lot of positions. That's why we're reducing the number of visions from 21 to 18. That's why each state now will generally have one vision. Jack Welch used to say that adding levels, layers, and boards is like putting on more sweaters. You don't know it's cold out because you've got all these layers on. Uh, I like to have my pulse on what's going on on the business. That's why I travel so much. Uh, I don't think that creating a separate board is going to stop this committee from doing what this committee does. And uh, I would just like to transform what we do into be working on the transformation in the future rather than what we've been doing, which is focusing on Do you think it's possible for us to assume that role, too? Because yes, I, I would I like to be that. I would like to be part of this transformation project, not just coming in here and screaming when there's a fire to put out. Yes, I do. And, and you're right. You did bring this up in the past. So, you know, we, we're all for it. So the recommendation that came from our assessment actually originated from best practices in private sector, as you mentioned right. with Mayo. I think the transformation requires a strong partnership and level of trust with the board, whoever they may be, and represent that. And in a situation that's complex as the veteran health care system, which is very complex and very distributed, it's not something you can pick up in just a couple hours. You saw when we did an in-depth study the amount of effort it took. For people to have enough familiarity to help make strategic decisions and guide levels of expected performance, you have to spend time. There's just no way around that. I think it would be great if this body did that. But some organizations say, you know, if I can, get an, if I can endorse a proxy to help advise me and spend that time to get familiar, to build those levels of trust, and then you then use that as a faster way to do it. To be quite honest, there are 25 advisory boards, but none of them really have governance properties. And that is why we thought it would help actually build the partnership. But if it doesn't build a partnership, then we wouldn't do it. I mean, that is the purpose of the governance board, is to build that trust by having people spend more time and also to avail yourselves of the best experts in the private sector. Because this is not just putting time in. It's putting, putting time in with people who have done this job from all different stakeholders. Well, I'd like to spend more time on that, I think, because I think we as a, a body need to explore this, whatever, because I'm always fearful of giving away our power, because I thought that maybe, and we talked about on, I think I have a record streak going here saying Denver, so I'm going to say it today again, Denver, that I said maybe we should be involved in change orders if that's what it takes to get our hands in this and take responsibility. So um, I'll leave you with this. And, Mr. Secretary, I know of all the things you got on your plate, you've got a lot, but I think people here need to recognize last week uh, this Congress allowed the Agent Orange Act to expire. And I think it's altogether possible that the study that we asked for an extension so we could see it that's going to come out in March is going to add hypertension and stroke to that. And you're going to add literally hundreds of thousands of people who, by the scientific data, are going to show, experience these catastrophic health consequences because of their exposure to Agent Orange. And the pressure is going to be on. If we don't have the courage to do it, they're going to ask you. And much like the Nehmer claims, it's going to add to your work. And I just lay that out there for our folks to start thinking ahead. It's a very good point. We've been working very, very very hard to clean up some of the things that have been hanging around. Uh, C-123, Agent Orange, for example, we've now cleared Which that Which I up. very much appreciate. No, I, you know, this is the right thing to do. Uh, Brown Water Navy, Blue Water Navy, we're going through all of these things detail by detail. The point is that, you know, I get lots of letters from members of Congress wanting to add more and more benefits for veterans, and I support that. But we also need the funding That's and right. the personnel That's to right. be able to do it. If we added, for example, and this is, this is not in the decision, but if we added another precondition 
uh, and we don't get the people to do it, right. the, the 80, 80 plus percent progress we've made on the backlog of claims will go away. That's correct. Because but your decision is going to be either to deal with that or to deny the claims, and I think all of us here need to recognize well, we, we're we, part of this. We'd prefer to do what's right for the veteran and then have you help us get the people we need to get it done. I appreciate it. Thank you for the time, Chairman. Well, and I think part of the problem is, and, and we're looking backwards, but this we were never asked for additional resources in order to deal with the presumptive claims that were added uh, in the in the past, and so I mean we we are more than willing to help. Uh, we weren't asked, and then all of a sudden there was a backlog, and and folks were using that as an excuse for the backlog, and and we just we need to work our way through it. So I agree with Mr. Waltz and and with the secretary as well, Mr. Hills Camp. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, this is a. Uh, Excellent topic for us to discuss. It's something obviously uh, we wanted to happen last summer and, uh, and a chance to actually get down into it. So, Mr. Byrne, I appreciate that. Uh, I am struck, though, by uh, some of the words that are used in here. And, and, and Mr. Secretary, I appreciate you being here. Uh, but uh, I, looking at this independent assessment, and I know it's a lot of pages. Uh, Mr. Secretary, if I missed that, how much have you read of this assessment? Uh, I've read all 4,000 plus pages. How much have you read? Excuse how me? How much have you read, sir? I've read 4,000 pages. Well, good. That's your job. That is my and job. Your job is to take a culture of a non-accountability on. There's a culture of silence. Do you disagree with that assessment? That folks are reluctant to speak up because of your lack of leadership? Uh, last September, there were people who were unwilling to speak up. That's the reason I've been to over 200 facilities, done town hall meetings in all of them. Uh, and I was. Does it still occur? That's the question. Could you answer the question, please? What was the question again? Is there a culture, do you disagree with the assessment that there's a culture of silence that your employees are afraid to speak up? Uh, I disagree with that. Uh, in the town hall meetings I have, Do you have, disagree with the are, fact that you're still in the midst of a up. leadership crisis at the VA? The assessment, you're in the midst of a leadership crisis. I am in the midst of a leadership crisis. That's the reason I brought on 13 of 18 new leaders. And that's also why I'm asking you to step up and provide uh, the, the support, support we need for the demand that we're facing. Do you need more staff in your headquarters program office? Is 160% increase in five years, is that not enough to take yeah, I, I care just of your wanna, needs? I, I saw that in the study as well, and I refer back to a letter I wrote to Chairman September 14th of 2014 that talked about the fact that the way VA, actually, I'm sorry, it's September 16th of 2014, that talks about the way VA codes these positions. Many of those people who show up in the headquarters staff are not in the headquarters staff. They don't live in Washington, D.C. They're outside Washington, D.C. The letter's right here. We can, we can look at so it. So there wasn't a 160% increase in your staff? In the, no. How much of an increase did you have? Uh, the VA workforce grew 36% between the end of the fiscal year 2007 and through August of 2014. Uh, the largest growth was in position to interact daily with our veteran population. Medically focused positions such as nurses, physicians, medical assistants, and claims. How much been increase in the position. central office is my question. Uh, about, uh, I, can, I can just help a little bit about that. The largest increases, Congressman, were essentially where field positions were aggregated and then moved into the central office. That was 420 positions between workforce management, between logistics and procurement, and emergency preparedness. So while there was an increase between 2009 and 2014, uh, it was not nearly as large as 160% because it was an aggregation of field positions to the central office. The assessment also compares the VHA to uh, uh, other nationwide or, or, or regional providers. And, I, and I, I, the comparison that caught my interest, Mr. Secretary, was of a provider that uh, cares for almost 3.3 million more patients, but does it with 114,000 less employees and 1,800 less physicians. C can you explain why you need 114,000 more employees to uh, take care of 3.3 million fewer patients? Uh, as you know, our patients uh, typically have very complex uh, situations. Uh, many of them have been uh, created by the battlefields that they serve on. Uh, so it's very difficult, and I think most of the studies that have been done, including the Congressional Budget Office study, find it very difficult to compare 
what goes on in the private sector and what goes on in VA. Maybe Dr. Shulkin would like to add because he's been in both. Well, um, you know, first of all, part of our job is to figure out how we can always do things better and more efficient. So I don't want to say that we're not always looking at that. But coming from the private sector, we're doing things in VA that are not done in the private sector. We're addressing uh, many, many more behavioral health, psychological issues. We're addressing caregivers. We're addressing homelessness. We are addressing services in our vet centers that just don't exist out in the private sector. So the comparisons are hard. Uh, to make well, I might ask Mr. Burner, I actually wrote the assessment. Uh, is that comparison make sense or, or are? Is probably with Kaiser. I have to go back and look at the, the data. But there are th several different aspects to, to make the comparison. One of them is that there is a risk uh, adjusted uh, risk for the different patient populations, and the veterans are different and sicker and older than other populations. That is one. Uh, factor in, and we did not do that risk adjustment to the CA. And secondly, uh, to be quite honest, the number of missions in the VHA are much more complex than in the private sector. Uh, we mentioned about the R&D, that's a massive, you know, one to two billion dollars of research a year they do. You talk about the training of 120,000 people they're doing. In the example of Kaiser, they are laser focused on just health care, and that makes their ability to have efficiencies and focus much, much easier. Now, if they took on those other things, I don't know if they'd be more efficient or not, but that's why it's very hard. And remember also, Kaiser is probably at the top, whether one of the high-performing healthcare systems. And the reason we went to those is because when we so, compared- And I'm out of time. Why did you use that comparison if you have no basis to make comparison? The I didn't read the 4,000 pages and- and uh, the reason could is, you explain that? When we compared VHA with the private sector, they're about average. But we saw this large variation that was unacceptable. So we said the only way to make that variation go away is to get the best performing practices. And that's why we shifted midway and said, let's start looking at the highest performing and make that the bar for VHA. Because that's the only way we felt you could get the variations out. If they're already about average, those variations are going to be maintained if that's at their bar. So Summer, you, you can't compare then. Is that your assessment? I can't do a comparison okay. of which Thank one you, Mr. More. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. McNerney. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I want to thank you, Mr. Secretary, uh, and I applaud your efforts uh, for taking a, a sort of a systemic look at this, maybe a 50,000 uh, foot view, because uh, I started with this committee in 2007. We've seen the budget increase greatly at that time, uh, and we've seen some improvement. For example, um, the disability uh, claims have improved. There still needs improvement. Uh, but then uh, all of a sudden this crisis in healthcare pops up. It seems like it's a, a whack-a-mole. You hit one thing really hard and some other problem pops up. So a systematic uh, look at this is really needed and I appreciate that. Uh, do you agree that a systems approach is the right uh, approach moving forward? Yes, sir, I do. Uh, I think one of the best business books ever written was the fifth Discipline by Peter Senge. He devotes uh, a lot of time in that book to systems thinking. Uh, I'm an engineer. I'm a systems thinker, and I would inc I, I like the systems approach that the that the independent assessment took. The only thing I would have liked more is if that independent assessment included in the system Congress. Is there any way to get them to add that uh, assessment? Well, I've made some suggestions. Their, their, their proposal was an independent board. I, I think uh, what, what I believe is that this is a unique moment in time. We've got two great committees with two great chairmen. We've got unanimity in the country. Let's work together. I think we can get it done without the board, and by the time we'll get it done before the board gets set up. Well, one of the problems in that interaction between Congress and the VA is, uh, in my opinion anyway, we have hearings and um, we're, it's not clear that we're being told the whole story. I mean, we can ask a specific question, we'll get a specific answer, but they'll avoid the, 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 the greater problem that may be something that we can help with. So we need a better level of communication between we, our two bodies. We, sir, we want you to know all the problems. And believe me, even though we've made some progress, it's just some. We have a lot more to do. Granted. Uh, the independent assessment looked at the demographics of veteran populations and stated that only half of the veteran population uses the VA uh, health care. What tools do you have available to help capture more of the veterans that, that could use health care? 
We, uh, we had developed a, uh, an advertising campaign with the Ad Council. I don't know how familiar you are with the Ad Council, but the Ad Council right. does pro bono work where companies put money in. Uh, we had done a, an independent campaign to encourage more, more veterans to sign up. We've, uh, we've not aired that campaign completely yet because uh, we need to build the capability to make sure we can take in uh, those more. The, so have you had an independent assessment of the, uh, of the return on investment that you've made in that? Uh, we have not yet. We, we, you know, we've done testing. To, the Ad Council did testing at their cost to show that the ads were effective, but we've not done any piloting of it to see how many people would come into the system. As I, as I said earlier, and uh, Dr. Giroux uh, supported this, veterans are only using the system for about 34% of their care, and every percentage point is $1.4 billion. So we have to be careful uh, as we bring more people into the system that we can take care of them. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm going to yield back. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Is it, is it your job to make sure that veterans receive health care or that veterans, more veterans come into the VA system? Well, uh, I think it's to take care of veterans. I mean, I'm, that's what I'm here to do. So if they're getting their health care somewhere else, they're getting their health care. Well, if, if a veteran wants to get his health care somewhere else, that's fine with us. We're, we're here for them. And as the VFW showed, you know, 82 percent uh, choose the VA. 87 percent recommend the VA. So, um, you know, we're here for them, and we want to build the capability for the number that come. And so my question is, is the ad focused on getting people to come back into the system, or is it to get people who are not getting health care at all? I'm sorry. No, it's to teach them how to sign up uh, on e-benefits. Okay, so they, they're, not even, they're, they're, they're not even in the system. Okay, but, well, we, it's a conversation that we need to continue. Uh, well, we do, because we, we need to, as we've talked, we really need to talk about re demand or requirements versus uh, support. And, um, and, and you, you talk about people coming to the, to the VA because they like the VA and it delivers the best and the most quality health care. You hear anecdotal evidence out there too that many veterans are going to the VA because you have no copays. Well, that's also true. So, I mean, we, we need, that needs to be part of, of the discussion as well. Uh, Dr. Winstrup. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank you all for the hard work that you've put in here today. One thing I'd like to address, Ms. Brown, I think in, in this committee there's no elephant in the room. I think that everyone wants to keep the VA up and running, but we can have the conversation about centers of excellence, and I do think that there are things specific to military duty that create the need for these centers of excellence, but we also talk about how veterans have so many comorbidities. We have to be able to address those as well, which is unique compared to a, to a private practice, and I also feel that we can have what we call VHA providers, VA providers, outside the walls of the VA and, and sort of break down that stigma as uh, you, you're not a VA doctor, but you can be outside the walls, and I think we'll all benefit from that. I especially liked uh, the analogy uh, today about anatomy and physiology, that we some may have too much anatomy and not enough physiology. You know, we can have a lot of... We can have a lot of anatomy, but if the heart rate's 30, it doesn't really help much, right? So uh, looking in that direction. But really, um, Dr. Jarrell, I appreciate what you have come here and, t and talked about today because it's something I've been talking about for three years, really taking a look at how we do our business. And it's nice today, for example, that some of the things are going to DOD, but as someone who's been in VA and DOD, they have some of the same issues as far as productivity. Because I know as a practitioner and reservist, I'll see 50 patients in my practice, but 15 in, in, the, in the DOD, and it's not because of comorbidities and sicker patients necessarily. So there are some areas where that applies and others where it doesn't. And so when we talk about increasing our numbers and we've got more appointments, we have to take a look at what we're really doing. Are we just extending hours or adding more providers, or are we actually increasing the productivity for the providers? And I think that that's a key component, and, and it sounds like we're talking about it. And in the VA, it is different, too, because most VAs are involved with education and training. That slows you down. There's no doubt about it. We all know that um, in, our, in our practices. But, that, but still, if we're talking about increasing to match the private sector to some degree, 
you know, 8%, that sounds nice, but when we're talking 200, 300% higher in the private sector, obviously there's a lot more we can, we can do. So I, I do applaud the decrease in wait times, the efforts being made, and actually finally having the frank conversation that I've been wanting to have for three years, of how we actually improve the capabilities of our, of our providers all across the board. One of the things that Dr. Abraham referred to, and I've, you've heard me refer to it, Mr. Secretary, is about the RVUs. You inherited a system that really couldn't tell you what we're spending per RVU. And we need to do that if we're really going to compare the cost of outside the walls of the VA and inside the walls of the VA. And until we can do that, we, we're, we really can't make good assessments of what makes sense. We need to be able to assess our physical plants. I'm encouraged to hear you say things like, yeah, you get, if you're a doctor with one treatment room, you cannot be productive. It just doesn't work. Uh, so we also need to look at total cost per RVU. Then we can start looking at facility cost per RVU, whether it's a CBOC or whether it's a hospital setting. And then, or, and specific clinics per RVU. Then we can make some smart decisions. So I guess the only question I really have is, are we getting closer to being able to do that? Yeah, um, Congressman, uh, we do have RVU data. We have work RVU data. And work RVU data is directly comparable because it's the time and effort a physician puts in before, during, and after the visit. And so that's where we can show you the comparisons. Uh, it's not two, 300% difference, but you are correct the private sector has higher hmm. RVUs than the VA. Uh, several reasons for that that you've mentioned. Our staffing ratios are far lower than they are in the private sector. Um, we can begin to start getting at the cost issue, but this is where it gets to, is the work that we're doing in VA comparable to the work that's happening outside in the private sector dealing with the pure physical components of care? Uh, but we are working towards that. Our commitment is to get the best value for the taxpayer and do the right thing for the veteran. So we are focused on efficiency and productivity as well as quality of care. But when I talk about costs, you understand I'm talking yeah. about the physical plant, the administrative costs, all those things, because when you refer outside of the VA, you're not paying their malpractice in their physical plant. You're just assess giving that, that fee for what they did, similar to what Medicare does to a provider. And that's what we have to take into consideration. And, and I know that's a behemoth, but we really have to be able to look at those types of numbers to make logical decisions as we move forward. And I'm talking about over the next decade. Yes, you know? yes, I, I agree with you. We are looking at those things. Medicare does reimburse them more than the work RVU. They reimburse on the total cost RVU because there are three components to RVUs that are calculated when you're paid. Uh, and VA has different infrastructure requirements than the private sector, but I do believe that you're pushing us in the right direction to take a look at these issues, and we're committed to doing that. Thank you very much. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Ms. Brandley. You're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Secretary, good to see you again. Thank you to all of you for the hard work that you have done to bring us uh, this report. And I apologize for being late. I was in another important uh, hearing that I had to attend. But I wanted to ask uh, Dr. Girwa a, a question. Um, the assessment refers to a, a long-standing truth in the veteran community. Um, if you've seen one VA hospital, you've seen one VA hospital. Um, and of course, uh, we want to be as veteran-centric as possible. Um, and certainly our veterans expect some level of standardization when it comes to not only intake, uh, but obviously their, their health care. So uh, what are the most important recommendations, do you think, uh, your report makes to ensure that veterans have a consistent experience within the VA system? Thank you again for that question. I think it's a very important one. In addition to the four cornerstones, I think a, a main principle here is, and, and again, no veteran cares about what the average is. The veteran patient cares about the experience of that patient. But on average, the VA does pretty well compared to the private sector, but the variability is, is tremendously wide. So there are fantastic, wonderful national leading practices, but there are also VA medical centers that, that lag far, be, far be behind the leading practices within the VA. And one of the recommendations that I think um, is obvious uh, or, or should be obvious and probably is obvious to the leadership panel is there needs to be a transparent open process to share best practices, to, ex 
to encourage innovation that are occurring in the visions. And if we focus on bringing the underperforming centers up to the level of the higher performing centers, you're going to have a system that is nationally, uh, could be nationally leading and certainly comparable to, to the best ones. So one of the most important things is yes, if you've seen one VA, you've seen one VA and that has to change because a culture of best practices needs to be developed and shared. And that's one of the primary recommendations of, of the panel. And I see everyone shaking their head. Well, this, is, this was the number one um, requirement when uh, David and I, when I was recruiting David for this position, is we simply have to do this. Um, we have pockets of excellence, but we got to get everybody up to that standard. The other thing we have to do is we have to do a better job with the employee experience, and I want to share this with you. Uh, last week, we took our top 300 leaders of VA off-site for training for three days. It's the first time they've ever been together for training even though this is what you do in the private sector all the time. This is a map of the veteran experience for the, comp, uh, for the CMP exam, compensation and pension exam. So there's technology that exists where you actually map the experience. You map the backstage, which is what's in the veteran's mind. You map the onstage, which is what happens when you, when you work with them. And you map the backstage, which is what you do in the backstage to make sure they have a great experience. And then you design your facilities consistent with this. So we had people off-site. Remember, the first strategy of my VA is to improve the veteran experience. We're mapping these experiences and improving them using Lean Six Sigma in the backstage and using design thinking in the front stage. This is what the very best companies in the world do. And this is why we have to train people. So will that be um, a, a, a benchmark, if you will, in terms of identifying the lower performing uh, facilities? Yes, this is a, a technology we were going to use to redesign our experiences in every facility in, across VA. And then we'll, have, can, we'll take the current best approach and we'll make sure everybody does that current best approach. The reason we started with the CMP exam is that's typically the worst experience a veteran and a, and a VA employee can have, and it's also oftentimes the first time VA touches a veteran. And so do you have an identification now of the lowest performing, the best performing? Yes, yeah, David can talk yep. about that. Yep. Um, I just want to reinforce what Dr. Garrar said. Uh, VA overall has lower mortality rates than the private sector hospitals do. VA overall has better patient safety rates than overall sectors do. But the variation is certainly there. And I think as, as Dr. Garr suggested, if we could bring everybody up a level, and we saw 44% of our medical centers actually improve their quality metrics last year, we could have a extraordinary healthcare system. And that's what we're, that's what we're designing to do. So our metrics now identify high performers, low performers. We know that. We're working with the low performers to get their performance up. It's exactly where our focus is. One of my top priorities to identify best practices. Thank you. And my time's out. I'll yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Dr. Beneshek. Uh, thank I'm you. I'm sorry. Man. I'm sorry. Mr. Kaufman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Secretary McDonald, um, uh, the President recently signed into law a piece of bipartisan legislation that essentially transferred uh, the VA's construction program uh, for projects costing more than $100 million uh, to other agencies such as the Army Corps of Engineers. Uh, as you know, there have been uh, billions of dollars of waste uh, in the VA's construction uh, management program uh, that could have been diverted towards uh, veteran health care and other benefits. Uh, are there other areas that you could look at um, in the VA that's really not your core mission like construction management that could go to uh, a private entity uh, such as um, oh, um, claims processing for uh, purchase care, uh, something that TRICARE and Medicare have been successful with? Uh, thank you for the question, Congressman Kaufman. We are, we are looking at that as part of our My VA transformation to see what it is we should do in our core business, what it is uh, perhaps we shouldn't do. But you know, the, the building thing is even more than that. I think, you know, if I look at the problems with the building, and I include the Aurora facility, each one was designed as a one-off. If, if Walmart builds a new store in Japan, that Walmart store in Japan looks very much like the Walmart store in the United States. 
As a result, if you transfer somebody from Walmart US to Walmart Japan, they know how to operate in that store. So not only your construction costs less because you keep building it, but your operating costs are less because people know how to operate in it. So one of the things we're doing with our construction, and I know we're, we're you know, we're, we're, we've got to work with, we will work with the Corps of Engineers over 100 million, is even what's under 100 million is how can we go to a modular design so that every facility is built the same and we can transfer people from one to the other and they can operate. And importantly, our patients will know where to go. I mean, consumers love shopping in stores where they know how to navigate the store. So I think, I think there's a much bigger idea in construction than just sure. giving it to the Corps of Engineers. I think we have more work to do. And I think also reviewing some of the requirements that you have in terms of force protection and, and other, you know, renewable energy requirements that are, that are nice to have, but that, that are, are over the top relative to what's done in the private sector and, I, and, I think, and clearly are driving costs as well. So, yes, as you know, those are right. our federal laws, federal requirements, right. and we'll work with you on those. Okay. Uh, Mr. Uh, Jabor, I think you, uh, uh, would you like to comment as well on the, on the um, what could be outsourced from the, from the VA that might be more effectively done? Again, thank you for the question, and, and the report was fairly comprehensive, sure. in, particularly in the business systems that need to be fixed one way or the other. For example, claims processing probably left almost $600 million right. in reimbursement on the table from 2014. Uh, the lack of automation in reviewing bills from the private sector. If you want networks to come and private physicians uh, to, to see uh, VA patients, they expect at least at some point in time to get reimbursed uh, for, for their services. So these are all aspects that we would hope there would be a critical analysis of either doing it in-house or certainly there are precedents for outsourcing these kinds of business functions uh, to get the efficiencies and ultimately divert that money back into patient care. Okay. Um, the integrated report uh, notes that VHA is in the midst of, 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 of a leadership crisis, according to this report. It said, quote, and almost every facility visited, at least one leader interviewed, mentioned that risk aversion and reluctance to, quote, unquote, speak up were a significant issue, uh, unquote. This retaliatory culture permeates across all levels of VA, and this committee has seen countless examples of, retali of retaliation against agency whistleblowers. Um, Mr. Secretary, uh, how are you dealing with the leadership crisis and the problems with, uh, with, within the culture of, 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 the, of the VA? This is a big issue. Um, number one, we've got to get the leaders in place. Right now, 90% of our medical centers um, have had a change in leadership, but we're, we're committed to that. David can talk about that in a minute. Number, number two is we've got to make it perfectly clear what kind of culture we want. Where we identify people retaliating against whistleblowers, we're disciplining them. Number three, we've been working with the special counsel to make sure that the 45 or so whistleblowers are get, get restitution uh, in a positive way within our organization. And I, I met with the, uh, the special counsel uh, just this week and we, we discussed this. How can we do a better job of this? Number four, we've been certified by the Office of Special Counsel uh, for doing the training that we need to do to, to, um, to improve on this. Number five, town hall meetings. We've got to have town hall meetings. We've got to get the, the, the light uh, shined on these kinds of things. We've got to listen to employees. And then importantly, I also meet privately with the whistleblowers and the union leaders uh, when I go to every site. Uh, Congressman, I would just add to what the Secretary said. We do have a crisis in leadership. We have too many open, vacant positions. We have too many people in acting positions and interim positions. You can't expect that you're going to have a transformation in a health system unless you have stable leadership in place. We need your help on this. We need your help to help create the VA to be an environment people want to come and serve and to be excited about. And we are asking for your help in Title 38 for uh, the hybrid Title 38 to be able to help get the right type of compensation for leadership positions in VA. That will help us a lot. I think, I, I think the one issue, uh, and I'll yield back, that we are, are divided on as a Congress, and I think uh, you're all um, divided on as well, and that is the need for personnel reform, the need to be able to, uh, within the entire organization, to fire those who are, in, to expeditiously get rid of those who are incompetent, uh, those who are not performing, uh, 
uh, those who have committed fraud, uh, to be able to get rid of them, it, it is simply too difficult. You, there, there is a, I think the principal uh, problem in the culture of the organization is that it is, is too difficult simply to get rid of those who are not performing. Uh, Mr. Secretary, when you were in Procter & Gamble, uh, clearly uh, you did not have, I, I think you had a more balanced approach uh, in, in, that, in that environment than exists here and, and it needs to change. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you, Dr. Benishek. Thanks. You're welcome. You're welcome. I just want to touch on a few specifics that uh, I think that came to my attention uh, from the report um, and something you brought up too, Mr. Secretary, and you mentioned, you know, the, you, using more leases to um, use the space. Well, I, that just reminded me of the, you know, the CBOC that we're trying to expand in my district in Traverse City and then the leasing process is like five years long. And, you know, if there is a way that we can help you speed that up because that's as long as the construction process. So, I, and I know there's a lot of bureaucratic reasons for that, but I think that's a, an issue that practically would help. Uh, we, we agree, and, and we're now going through a lean process on, a, a, a lean study on that process, and we'll be back to you with the help we need. Um, I'm just going to mention another issue, and that is about this n nursing practice guidelines within the VA. Um, you know, there's a lot of concern, you know, as a surgeon from uh, the anesthesia department, independent practice of, of nurse anesthesia, there doesn't seem to be any additional information about nurse anesthesia safety versus the, you know, the family practice type nurse practitioners out. I just, can you tell me what the situation was that? I just want to make sure that our veterans are safe. We, we uh, put together a new nursing handbook, which is now online for comment. Um, I did get quite a few letters from members of Congress, particularly doctors, who thought that uh, nurse, uh, nurse practicing anesthesiology was going too far. Um, we've noted that uh, on, the, on the website. Um, on the other hand, I've also gotten letters from nurse practitioners who say we should take full advantage. There's some studies available out there, uh, one of which I think is a DOD study that says the safety is the same, uh, if not better, but I'm out of my medical I just, school. I just let me let know what, where you're at. Let me just go on to another issue, Dr. Shulkin. What exactly, give me, can you give me an example of um, how you're taking the environment where we have this some good hospitals and some good directors and some good processes and then the, the variability. What, what have you done so far on the job? I know you just started a little while ago to make this better, to get the best practices from one facility to another. Can you give me a specific thing? Because we touched on this issue many times here in our discussions here, and I just want to get some ideas. Specifically, what have you done to make that better? Yeah. Um, at, as I mentioned before, um, we have a measurement system that we call SAIL, which is, which is a metric system that puts together all these quality measures so we can identify high performers and low performers then we're putting the high performers together with the low performers. We're actually going on site with the low performers and sitting down with their leadership team to make sure they understand what the data says, understand the reasons why they're not able to adapt to the best practices, whether it's hiring reasons, competency reasons, training reasons. Uh, what and level are we talking about here now? Is this the, the department director? Uh, this, I mean, can, can you give me we have, more specific? We have out of our out of our central office. We have a quality organization that are led by physicians. Those physicians actually travel to the sites of the low performers. They bring the data. They meet all day with the leadership team. They set an action plan in place and then they revisit whether there's improved performance. They're using what really the independent assessment has recommended, a continuous quality improvement process cycle, but we, where we're setting goals and objectives, and we're using the strengths of the best practice sites to help teach the lower performers. And this is why we saw 44% of our medical centers make significant improvement 
over the last year? Well, I, I just want to relate one anecdotal uh, problem to you as long as I have your attention here too, and that is I still have contacts within the VA uh, system from physicians who relate to me that um, they try to improve, for example, uh, the colonoscopy performance rate and yet they are being pressured by uh, the peer review process uh, to not complain so that uh, the discipline does not appear to be related to the complaints but to something different in their practice mode. And I just want to be sure that you're aware of that, yeah. that that's going on. And I mean, I get a lot of complaints from right. VA physicians about that issue. So I just right. wanted to bring that to your so attention I, I, today. I, I appreciate that. I, I've, I've yet to meet doctors that are afraid to complain. So, so they're usually pretty good, particularly when it, when it deals with patient issues. So uh, I, I always encourage doctors to speak up and to well, speak their I mean, mind. Well, to me, that's a very important because we provide the information that leads to better care and faster and more efficient care, and we just like to see those changes implemented rather than punished. Uh, if you get those calls, please have them call David or me, and we'd be happy to jump on them. Yep, yep. Gentlemen, thank you very much for being here today. Thank you for the work that you've all done, both on this $68 million uh, study. Uh, and Mr. Secretary, honestly, we, we thank you for what you do. Dr. Shulkin, uh, I think, is a great partner in this process. Uh, I think you want to do the right thing. I, I think many of us are still concerned that uh, the culture within the system is so hard to break. Uh, I don't know that there is a buy-in yet at the mid-level uh, as it relates to construction uh, of facilities as you said, to build one in Japan versus one in the United States. I think that is the appropriate. Many schools do that uh, so that they're all the same. And, and I just, you know, we, we want to be a partner in this process. Um, uh, we do have to look backwards in order to go forwards as well. And I know that is not what you would like to do, uh, but we don't want to get into the mess that we found ourselves uh, in over a year ago. This committee is in a bipartisan fashion, committed to working uh, together to give you the tools that is necessary to serve the veterans of this country. Without objection, all members would have five legislative days with which to revise and extend uh, their remarks or add any extraneous material. Uh, and Ms. Brown would like to say something. Absolutely, Mr. Chairman. And uh, well, let me uh, thank the committee for being here. And I want to thank the chairman that has agreed that, the, that we are going to take a field trip to Denver Regional Complex Center. Uh, we've had lots of discussions, and I think it will be good for the committee to go and visit with the facility. And then I think it will be good to stop by New Orleans to see how that is progressing also. So um, with that, I am very interested in, in the last closing remark about you are on track, I understand, with the homelessness uh, closing that out. And I'm wondering in the study, uh, one of the problems I found when I went to LA, West LA, uh, there was 400 units just standing there for over two years because the state did not have the funding even though we had provided the grant. So in the studies that they uh, look at some of our partners like different states as we move forward because they play a vital role in making sure that we move forward with the veterans programs. We, we have fixed that and uh, in fact uh, Mayor Garcetti recently announced uh, I think it was a hundred million dollars that he's putting against uh, homelessness in LA. If we don't fix the problem in LA we won't fix it nationally so we're all we're all laser-like focused on it. Thank you and thank you Mr. Chairman. Thank you Ms. Brown and for the record um, I saw the Secretary's eyes get wide a second ago. I, I wasn't talking about a full committee field hearing uh, out at the uh, Denver Regional Facility. Uh, what I was doing was saying Ms. Brown is welcome to go out there uh, at any, t any time she would like to. At this time, this hearing's adjourned.